we're going to look at uh, curating and commissioning, and I've tried to kind of position this both within a kind of institutional context, but also in a sort of freelance capacity, um, and also curating uh, visual art, fashion, um, whatever it may be that you're um, interested in. So the first question, we're going to start off um, with, the, with the basics. And uh, who has a response to this? this? This simple question, what is curating? Anybody want to have a go? First participant of the day. Thank you, Luciana. <laughs> go ahead. No, no, you don't have to raise your hand. Go for it. Um, it's all about, um, well, one, one of the things uh, that um, is incorporated into curating is, is about um, having a concept that you want to develop. And that can be in the form of an exhibition, so you can come up with a concept. Um, you're deciding on um, what's going to be representing your concept. Um, and uh, if it's an art exhibition, uh, the paintings, uh, the flow, okay. uh, the materials. Okay. So you're, you're deciding on the main element. Okay. An exhibition, for example. Okay, so sort of uh, selection and somehow relaying a concept through artworks of some kind. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Uh, okay, anybody else? Any other thoughts on this? Um, I think the idea of curating is that you have to You know, that's my next slide. Have you looked at my slides? <laughs> okay, yeah, oh, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> uh, looking after yeah. the, the sort of collections of a specific institution. Or, um, uh, but I think uh, I like, I, I think it was um, the guy that curates at several times that says that, um, that it's about making connections mm -hmm. as well, and connections between objects, artists, ideas, Okay. So now I quite like that sort of understanding of uh, selecting, but also connecting, acting as a sort of agent of. Okay. So, so I, I think you're talking about uh, Hansel Rickobrist. Yeah. A well-known curator who's been uh, kind of well, probably ten years now at the Serpentine. Who, yes, likes this idea of. Um, uh, how does one artwork influence the interpretation of the, the artwork that you kind of place next to it, putting, so maybe not only concept, but context to, to the work. Um, okay, so, well, this is um, uh, a term that is become very popular. So the first curating course was actually um, here in London, the Royal College of Art in 1991. I um, mean, there's been an explosion of these kinds of courses since then. And it's become this thing that we curate everything. We curate, um, I don't even know what this is, a curated closet. Um, <laughs> sounds, sounds good. This is a kind of um, uh, a festival at South Bank where they um, invite a, a well-known individual, in this case Yoko Ono, to curate um, events and music things. So this is interesting because the, the curator has become the kind of superstar in the picture, whereas it, in, in the, the, kind of, the lineage of art history, it was, it was, well, first it was the artist, then maybe it was the, the critic, and now it's you know, the curator. And then this is my favorite. Kanye West once tweeted, if I had to be defined at this point, uh, I'll take the title of an inventor or maybe a curator. So, <laughs> so we can say that you know that it is it is a it is a term that is certainly um, overused, and I think some would say misused. Um, and you know, you you perhaps I, th there are some interesting theories about this about how we're all curators in the age of, of social media, and and you all had an experience with this with your workflow pages, you are essentially choosing images um, that tell the story of your lives, right? Um, other analogies that I quite like, um, 
you know, curators are, are authors, they tell a story through images or artworks. Um, and another one which I think works very well from um, you know, a, a kind of operational perspective is um, th this analogy of the architect. So you're the kind of center point, um, but you draw upon the expertise of um, you know, a whole team of people. So an architect works with a structural engineer, um, an interior designer, but maybe holds on to the kind of the, the central creative concept. Um, and certainly as a curator, and I'll, and I'll explain a bit more about that, you are um, uh, holding on often to the, the central idea, but, but are the focal point for lots of people kind of working around you. So, um, just as Janina said, um, <laughs> this, uh, this term actually originates, uh, it's a Latin word that means to care for. Okay, so this is one of the things that we are charting in this course is the kind of evolution from this very um, traditional understanding of uh, a curator who um, looks after a collection, um, is, has an in-depth knowledge perhaps of a narrow area of art history. Um, and what we're seeing now is um, you know, much more kind of dynamic um, use of the word and um, in many cases people are, are called curators but they're they're not really I mean I think they're um, and Capucine who's coming next will sort of talk about this in some ways they're you know they're producers they're they're um, putting on theatrical productions in a way that this kind of curator never never would have done so what I'm gonna do is just very quickly do um, a kind of crash course in like three slides um, on the history of curating again just to make sure you have this foundation um, this is uh, 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 okay crash course on the history of exhibitions let's say that anybody want to go and just give me one um, definition here uh, what is an exhibition a display, a display. okay Yes, yes, and certainly we, we understand it that way uh, now. Yeah, okay, any other thoughts? Within a theme, okay, okay. Okay, okay, good. So, kind of back to this idea of the concept, the theme, the story. Um, A physical thing can be yes exactly uh, so one of the things yeah yeah could it could be but now we're moving again uh, into kind of new understandings of a lot of these terms could be um, I mean you know what's happening outside today is that an exhibition I don't know I don't know a event a festival I'm not sure um, okay, so um, this, uh, if we go way back, um, the history of curating kind of often begins with this, the, the salon. So these are um, I exhibitions in uh, France that um, essentially, as you can see, this is called a salon style hang. And what it was all about was cramming kind of as much into the space as possible um, with, with relatively little <coughs> selection processes. Um, and this was the, the norm for many, for many years. Um, I'm going to just take you through kind of pivotal moments, I think, in the development of what we kind of take as normal or, um, for, for, for an understanding of exhibitions today. Um, okay, so we're skipping ahead uh, 100 years or so. This is um, what, it, what many consider to be the first blockbuster exhibition. This is an exhibition of Italian art at the Royal Academy. And uh, the Royal Academy 
prior to this point had had kind of two shows, summer shows and winter shows. And this is moving towards this idea of an exhibition having a theme, but actually um, it was essentially, as you can see, um, a large scale chronological survey of Italian art. So it was, this again was the, the, the kind of norm for a period. Uh, it relies quite heavily on, you know, in-depth art historical knowledge. Um, and you chart, you, you, you tell a story, but it's a very kind of accepted narrative. This is Italian art in this period. Nonetheless, this exhibition attracted huge numbers of people, um, had a catalog, and had a uh, corresponding events program, which is, you know, sort of, again, things that we see as kind of normal today, w which were not necessarily the norm back then. Um, is anybody familiar with, with Harold Zaman? Mm? Jonathan, you might be? Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so Harold Zaman is, um, many people uh, consider to be the first kind of modern curator. Um, and he um, did a number of things that, we, again, we now take to be kind of uh, normal practice, um, but he firstly uh, really developed this idea of uh, not only selecting an artwork and putting it in a space, but rather selecting an artist and then asking them, what do you want to do in the exhibition? So that's this whole kind of concept of uh, commissioning that we uh, take to be uh, you know, pr pretty, pretty normal practice these days, developing a new work specifically for an exhibition. Um, he established curating as a, as a creative practice. So he saw his uh, role as a, as a kind of auteur, that he could create a theatrical setting in which to encounter the work. So again, uh, previously the curator's hand was, was supposed <coughs> to be invisible, you know? Um, and it is around this moment that we start to see um, the curator, you know, this is, uh, well, uh, this is a black and white image, but some of his images, you know, doing things like painting the walls red and green and really setting a, a scene for the, for the artworks. He's taking a much more um, creative approach to the, to the, um, to the process. Um, this was also around the moment where there was, you know, massive developments in artistic practice towards conceptual practices and the whole idea that artworks could not only unfold in space but also over time. So performance and video and um, sound pieces. Um, this um, exhibition was originated in the Kunsthalle Bern in 1969 and it was called When Attitudes Become Form and it was very much working with some of these uh, conceptual artists who again uh, you know were invited with with no idea of what they would actually do in the space um, so it's about kind of having a relationship with artists and trusting them and knowing their practice um, rather than you know selecting an object uh, that has a whole kind of art historical narrative around it. Um, uh, his exhibitions are tied to a central concept and um, assembles, he assembles artworks into kind of new themes. So it's not chronological, um, it may involve a variety of mediums. Um, and then again, from an operational uh, perspective, a kind of cultural management perspective, um, Harold Zaman would be the first, what, what we would now call freelance curator. So he left working in institutions and instead kind of started pitching uh, concepts to different institutions, which again is um, a more common practice these days. 
and also, um, I mean, I don't know how he did it, but, um, you know, operated in this kind of much more entrepreneurial sense. So he would come to institutions saying, I've, you know, I've got a sponsor for this exhibition, will you let me stage it here? So again, that's um, quite a different way of, of um, realizing something rather than just kind of drawing solely on the institution's budget to, to make something happen. I don't know, actually, um, uh, but I know that you know operating in this way and moving around to different institutions gave him a bit more freedom. Um, but good question. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, now we just take that as kind of co common practice. Um, so anyway, often um, uh, kind of. Uh, nicknames like the father of curating and, and um, seen as a pivotal moment in the history of curating. Okay, so next qu question for you. Um, either within an institution or uh, working in a freelance capacity, how would you develop an exhibition concept? What kind of questions would you ask yourself? Maybe what is relevant, like in terms of context, or so what is, uh, yeah, what's, what's happening now? Okay, what's relevant, what's happening now? Yeah, what's happening now? Definitely. I mean, this. Famous artists as well? Yes. Kind of, or like emerging artists that they're trying to start to be. Okay, I think you said kind of two things. I mean, one question is always asked, why is it timely? Right, and that's I think if you think of um, exhibition making as a as a research practice, which it which it is, I think as well. Um, that's a question that that you'll always have to kind of ask yourself: Why is it timely? Why now? Um, and you said kind of emerging artists, so maybe uh, seeing it as a platform for um, you know somebody that deserves that but hasn't yet had that that platform so it's about kind of exposure that is due um, sometimes that can be an emerging artist sometimes it can be an artist that uh, has it, it, it is 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 important in art history but was overlooked you know so it would, wouldn't necessarily have to be kind of contemporary but yeah any other thoughts Okay, so being maybe provocative in some sense, asking new, uh, maybe not only presenting something, but kind of challenging things. Yeah, very much so. What else? Uh, uh, sorry, could, uh, could this, this venting here or something, can yeah. you speak up? Well, yeah, uh, things like what's your audience? Yes, uh, thank you. Okay, so a more sort of strategic perspective there. Um, who's the audience for this? Uh, do you have the money? Um, what else did you say? Uh, location. Location, yes. What, so not only why now, but why in this place? Yep. Um, you'd ask about things, types of um, media that you potentially want to bring into the Yep. You would. You've got to start. You didn't say that, but you've got to start with an idea. Well, y yes, yes, and it, it is always kind of managing the practical alongside the conceptual, you know. So, and certainly, medium, you know, um, is 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 a huge part of both. You know, I mean, usually in an exhibition, the most um, expensive thing is either commissioning the work or transporting the work. So, the material is is very important. Um, okay, so the first th uh, kind of three, I think, are maybe if you're working within an institution, um, maybe more relevant, um, but also, and, and then these kind of re relevant to uh, freelance capacity or, or an institution. So I think we kind of hit these, but um, how does it fit within my organization's vision you know again this is very much about the the context um, I think there are uh, you know certainly in a, a, a landscape for cultural production like London it's very competitive so the more kind of clearly defined you are about what you do I think 
better uh, the better you uh, stand. So um, uh, we know that. I think we were, we were talking about this last night with somebody. You know, I think the the, um, the Barbican is an institution that I think is very clear about its 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 vision for uh, offering a, a truly interdisciplinary um, uh, experience of art. And I think they, in this competitive landscape of London, they do very well in doing the architecture, fashion, photography. They always have. Uh, exhibitions every year that engage one of those subjects in, in not quite the same way that anyone else does. Um, so that's a kind of niche that they've um, kind of carved out for themselves. I mean obviously Tate has kind of world leading um, platform that it has to fulfill. Um, what do you, what's the mission? You know, what, what are you trying to achieve with this? Who are you trying to reach? Is it education? Is it um, excellence? You know, what, what is it all about? Um, program. How do you think, what do I mean by that word, program? <coughs> Yeah, yeah. So normally this might, uh, I mean, we're kind of, I, I guess, uh, that there's a the, there's the broad context of the institution, but then there's the, you, you curate an exhibition, but you also curate a program, right? So uh, how does it fit with um, the exhibition before it and the exhibition after it? And sometimes, you know, that that's quite... Uh, structured my uh, experience at the ICA it, it, there were certain criteria one was um, we want a group show we want uh, a solo show you know every year we want a group show we want a solo show we want an international artist we want a young British artist you know so I'm not sure if that those kind of criteria are always relevant um, or uh, not relevant always um, um, explicit to an audience but sometimes there are um, you know quite kind of uh, boxes that you'll be ticking in a program and you can be strategic about this as well so um, I remember there was it was quite um, evident a few years ago when the Hayward Gallery did um, an exhibition of Jeremy Deller who is a uh, you know at the time kind of slightly less well-known artist and David Trigley who's a quite uh, popular um, artist who you know sells books and kind of shops and sort of cartoon art and you know both great artists um, but they put them both on at the same time and why might they have done that? Because they commented on each other. Commented on each other yes conceptual um, uh, explanation for that why else? Yes, one would drive audience for the other, you know, and, and actually there was a bit of sort of criticism around it, like, uh, oh, it's too obvious what you're doing, people don't know Deller, Shrigley is a big name, and, you know, but, but you have to think about these things in uh, not only, like, what, what, what are the relationships within the exhibition, but what are the relationships between the exhibitions. Uh, what do I want my, this exhibition to Can achieve? A yeah. About you yeah. And you're saying my program. Did you say it's to do with Charlotte's program? Did I say my program? Well, you were saying my program there. Oh, questions you would ask yourself, yeah. Yeah, so mm. how important is the curator of the previous exhibition that you did? Yeah, how important are you in all that? Well, I think that you are acting as a as a representative and an ambassador of the organization. So I would say it's um, you are empowered to interpret these larger questions, the vision and the mission. And actually, it's an, it's an interesting question because I think that sometimes people overestimate the um, individual decisions. Uh, and this is, you know, back to kind of Becker, there's more structure in some of this than we imagine. So in my kind of curatorial capacity, I'd get artists ringing up and saying, I want to donate my work, um, I'll give it to you for free, you know, can you make an exhibition? And I'd say, well, you know, uh, I, I can't really because actually uh, we, we don't take exhibitions from people that haven't kind of 
achieved a certain bit on their CV. You know, it isn't, uh, it isn't really me just saying, I think this artist is great. You know, it, it, I, I, I'm not empowered in that sense, and I think that's appropriate. There's more structure than, than you would imagine. Artists that, that end up at the, the Barbican or the Tate or whatever, you know, they, they are, they're likely to have had some kind of validation in art. You know, most likely they went to an art school that we know, they've had, you know, regional shows, they're starting to be collected. So, in some sense, uh, I would say that you're kind of less uh, empowered than people think that you are. Well, a private space, yes, a small private space, um, you can uh, be a bit more maverick in your decisions, I would say, for sure. Yeah, yeah. May you say maybe that uh, a creator is a sort of guardian of conventions? Uh, I interesting. What do you guys think about that? Provocative statement there. An a curator is a guardian of conventions. Yeah. Who do you think? Yeah, yeah. What do you think? Well, a gatekeeper. A gatekeeper. In some senses, um, and that criteria that each organization has, whether it's very open or whether it's more implicit, is also a way of sort of keeping. Yeah. What the certain so artists. So, uh, a question for you, how do we push boundaries then? When I said that, I, was, I have in mind the, the, the definition of uh, bankers. Uh, yes, yes. So, uh, convention doesn't mean necessarily something bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Are, what, about, uh, what about experts? Because that's a very kind of contentious term. Do you think curators are experts? Well, it is, it certainly comes across as somebody who uh, sort of maintains certain uh, standards yeah. of quality or intellectual rigor. You know? yeah. Not everybody can be a, can be a creator of the debt. Okay, so in some sense, uh, you have a cut, you're, you're, you're trusted for this. You know, background that you have, and and in a sense, you do you you allow certain things to come through and certain things to not. Um, but you're working with an implicit understanding of the expectations that uh, of what we let through. You know, as I was saying, you if you are working at Tate and and you give an exhibition to an unknown artist, um, you'd be kind of operating yeah. uh, recklessly. Yes. Yes. Because of her understanding and yes. quality attached to her that, that, that was uh, that that was trusted. Exactly. Yeah. I guess what happens as well is that if as a curator you take a risk with um, an unknown artist or a, a sort of an idea that is a little bit out of the ordinary, you put online your reputation and your, mm. and if it's a flaw, yeah. uh, then, uh, you know, it's you that is on the line. And, yeah. And, and you're, mm. So, you know, there's an element of sort of trying to also play within a yes. relatively safe or safer Yes, and I think uh, when you take, when you work with an artist that doesn't have um, the backstory that we would expect at a certain level, um, it, it, there are situations where I think that happens, and, and this is quite an interesting just kind of aside because I think it's increasingly an issue. Um, actually, when I was at the ICA, there was a, a situation where private gallery agreed to pay for an exhibition at the ICA of a young artist of theirs who was uh, beginning to get a reputation but not much of a CV. Why is that problematic? Like is it problematic? A like buying access in a way. Yeah, buying access. Why, uh, why would they want to do such a thing? Why would they want to pay for an exhibition? Paulina. To, to, prop up the CV. 
to prop up the CV. Yeah. It's custom. If they get an exhibition at the ICA, it's totally Exactly. So what? Do you, it's tempting, you know. It's tempting as a as a as an institution to do that to say, well, all right, this is a. It was a, a young artist from New York. Um, galleries offering to put lots of money to to basically budget the show to pay for the full budget of the show. Um, but you have to kind of step back to this, you know, as I was saying, there is more of a kind of pathway um, and people will scrutinize motivations um, if that evidence isn't there, you know. But that's not to say you can't do it. Um, but we see uh, more and more these kind of relationships between public and private sector. And um, this, again, is, is kind of is questions of ethics and, and how we deal with situations like that. I think there's a, great, there's a really large pressure by um, private groups. I mean, all the Damien, all the young British art period, there's lots and lots of public exhibitions which really filled the backstory for the young British artists. So a lot of the exhibitions at Branch Tate and at various different big major public galleries were filling in that backstory so that people could understand but also increase the value of Damien Hurst's work. Yeah. And this happens uh, with you know pri private collections and, and Saatchi, who is obviously a, a key player in this whole YBA movement. And he was, you know, doing this thing of lending his work to the Royal Academy to show his collection. Oh, it's, it's so generous. But obviously that increases the value of the collection massively, right? So again, um, you know, back to our kind of networks, all these kind of interrelationships are, are charged with very difficult uh, questions of ethics and motivations and, 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 and we are increasingly moving into an age of transparency, you know, so these are very complicated field that we're navigating. Yes, Janina. I just think that this is why these the questions, uh, the first two questions are the vision and the vision uh, uh, are quite important. Because yeah. I think if you can't justify your risk taking the, the, uh, in view of your vision or mission then that becomes a bit more acceptable yes. and, and, and so on and so forth. And, the, and this is something that you have to keep uh, at, at, at every level of the organization. It sounds obvious, but um, you know, there's a huge uh, pressure these days for audience numbers. You're working at the Barbican, uh, in the, or let, let's say you're working at the BFI in the, uh, and, and you're programming. You could put on the next Star Wars and you could get tons of people into the space, <laughs> you know, but that doesn't fit your vision, does it, you know? And this is um, often the case, I think, with, again, the curator kind of uh, holding on to this, these ideas and, you know, communicating this, this vision with, with marketing, with fundraising, you know, everybody has to be linked to that vision and it has to frame what you're doing, otherwise, um, well, yeah, uh, you, you can't prioritize things like audience numbers or, or fundraising over that core concept of the vision, I think. Um, any, any other thoughts? For it? Yes, Kasia. Um, well, just that these questions really align with what I, as a marketer, would ask myself about advertising. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but I think sometimes we're afraid to think about, uh, you know, what we do as kind of cultural producers in those terms, but actually we are engaging with audiences, we're trying to um, increase audiences, so um, I think the rhetoric is actually more similar than maybe we'd like to acknowledge at first, yeah? So I just want to, um, again, just give you a quick, and I'm going to try to do this for all of the um, uh, kind of um, crash courses and markets and everything, just give you a quick sense of how it works, who's involved, um, who are the players in this whole framework of, kind of curating in an, in an institution in this case. Um, because again, you know, back to that idea that I was saying at the beginning, um, I think this is a quite a good way to understand it. 
that uh, the curator, I wish we had a bigger screen actually, can you see this? Yeah. Curator is, is often starts the concept, um, but a good curator I think uh, you draws upon all these other areas of expertise and doesn't and, and doesn't kind of hold on to the knowledge for too long so um, how do you um, essentially work with all of these different departments so curating and learning this is like uh, extremely um, important relationship these days I mean if you read the mission statement of the Tate I think education is like the first thing there, um, but it can be quite a fraught relationship. You know, is it is it the curator kind of saying, "This is what we're doing now. You do something alongside," or is it a kind of collaborative um, experience? And I think definitely the future is much more collaboration um, and blurring of these two. Um, I just say that yeah. It's, it's what point people talk. Exactly. Creates the hierarchy. Creates. Exactly, and I think if anything, there's there's tension that maybe sometimes this curatorial department doesn't uh, bring in these other areas, you know, and and down to sort of like um, the bookshop, you know. I mean, just to be sort of very practical about it, um, there's normally a curated display around an exhibition, but you as a curator are holding on to that concept. Um, and yet you have a team of people kind of ready to get in all the relevant, you know, and this, you know, this is a commercial revenue stream. Um, you might be organizing, you know, crazy events at the Tate uh, in, it, that you're planning to on a Friday night, and, but you haven't actually thought about how people are going to pay for it and what that means for the front of house that are ticketing this thing, um, you know, Design. What's the relationship with um, you know either a, a in-house or external design team? I mean, how how does that? What's the relationship with curatorial? Yeah, all the exhibitions are sort of turning into a brand as well. You know, with, with branded merchandise stuff which you then can sell online. So how do you uh, you're putting together an exhibition? Um, what aspects of it are designed uh, that would you be working with a design team w with? Uh, design. Sorry. Uh, Sorry. Uh, graphic design is, is uh, one. What else? And what, what would you be using graphic design for? Brand. brand. Uh, how is it evidenced? Catalogs. Catalogs. Uh, Website. Online, yes. Exhibition design. See, this is a, this is a large place like you know Tate or Barbican. You probably have a team of people helping you, you know, move walls. Um, but again, you know, you're working with uh, a whole network of people. Uh, you might be doing an exhibition on you know 18th century photography, and you ha you've been studying that now for two years. You know the look and feel that it should have, and it's about how you communicate that to the people that are you know maybe doing the font. You know, so it's about being able to um, interact with these different departments to come to a kind of unified. Um, understanding of what you want to communicate. So yes, all of that stuff. Um, catalogs, web presence. Uh, what about development? At what stage do you talk to, this is um, kind of fundraising, at what, what stage do you talk to them? As soon as, soon as you have the uh, concept ready, it yeah. would impact your, uh, whether you can take it forth or not. Yeah. And if you're working in a kind of entrepreneurial, uh, if you're pitching place, you know, a concept, you know, it's very helpful to say, look, I've got this idea, this, I've got somebody keen to fund it, you know. Uh, yes, Irina. Ah. Because, yeah. Like, sometimes, you know, if you're like a bank, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's um, so actually I think I talk about this in my um, funding uh, intense lecture, but it's, um, 
again, it's funny because it's called sponsorship, but we could actually call it advertising. <laughs> I mean, so essentially the way that it works is you would have, uh, I mean, it's usually like Tate, a rubric that says, you know, 25,000 pound donation, you get a, I don't know, 10 centimeter uh, text logo. Uh, 100,000 pound donation, you get um, a color uh, pictorial, you know, logo on exhibition panels and leaflets. So there's a tiered, um, way that you, so it, it is, I mean, I'm sort of being slightly um, uh, provocative in saying it's advertising, but, you know, it, it, these, these companies are not getting nothing out of it, you know, and in some s cases it's very structured what you get for what you donate. And, and th that's usually, um, it, it can be quite a, um, a fraught conversation, you know, oh, we don't want the, we want the logo to be this big, no, we want the logo to be that big, you know, um, because there is a sense that too much kind of branding um, of sponsorship um, dilutes the message. Yeah. But I don't think that's perhaps the most important thing for the companies who are doing it is more, <coughs> for example, for banks to get their staff private events or networking events or stuff. I don't, I don't think the logos are yeah. Any more important at that one. Of course, they are a bit, but you know, it's all that other stuff that you can do around it. That's. Yeah. Depends, yeah, but it also depends on what the motivations are, yeah, for yeah. why you're doing it. Yeah. You know, obviously, if, if that's the main, if you really want to be associated with the arts, and you want a lot of mm. messaging around that to, to be going to market then actually the more you can get, the, the more um, material you can get your logo onto, the better. So well, yeah, I, I'm going to um, draw a line under that because actually in our funding um, moment we'll, we'll talk about that and, and, and um, we've got, I've got some quotes from, you know, businesses that support arts and it's exactly as you say, it's both, you know, why do they do it, logo, um, kind of staff, uh, mor morale, retention, all of these things are pride, are increased by corporate sponsorship of, of art events, access, all these things. So it's a very interesting relationship with lots of different dynamics at play. But I'll move on because I'm just, yeah. Uh, well, I'm issue, I guess it's sort of part of some of the people, but, you know, patrons and members, and yeah. the, um, uh, French and all these institutions that think they're Rather than the corporate uh, sponsorship, do you mean? Yeah. 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 With a different yeah. relationship. Because they, they're always there. Yeah. The yeah, and they blur. I mean, they're uh, audience, but also um, part of your fundraising strategy. <laughs> yes. And and most institutions would say that that members are you know the the foundation of the institution. Yeah. So uh, just to give you a very quick kind of um, practical glimpse into what, what do you do <laughs> in making an exhibition. Um, this is an exhibition schedule. Um, it, these are all available online, so have a look because it's quite interesting. You know, everything from, you know, obviously the research, if you're at an institution like Tate, that might be two years, you know. If you're at a smaller um, kind of Kunsthalle model, it might be like three, six months, um, requesting work, you know, various moments here, meeting with the bookshop, booking transport, sending out the press release, all of these things, again, it's back to that kind of architect, architect analogy, you are overseeing, you're prompting all of these things to take place. Where online is this? Uh, where online is it, Tim? <laughs> yeah, it's on Moodle week four, Moodle week four. Week three. Yeah. Week three. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and here I've also given you, uh, I mean, not much to discuss here, but this is a sample budget to give you a sense of, you know, a big part of the job here is managing a budget. So these are the things that you, um, uh, the kind of money that you move around and you look after. Transport, events, exhibition installation, etc. Um, let's see. 
I'm going to, yep, I'm going to stop there. Of course, uh, I've run out of time already. But um, we will find some time later on today to just, th the next aspect I wanted to discuss with you was commissioning. And just very briefly, you know, how do you create a new artwork um, uh, with an artist? What could go wrong? Because there's a lot. So I'll start, start with some of the horror stories. Um, but we'll just pause there because we've got our guest speaker coming in. So, yes. Sorry. Um, in a, all, this whole lecture, I think you used the word uh, produce, producer, one, so it was. So, to me, if you're just a producer, you know, not, you get, is there anything wrong with this word? Well, I, I think it's um, becoming more um, appropriate when we think about the kind of work that is being produced. So a curator was, that wouldn't have been so appropriate when we were thinking about you know, moving a painting from here to there. But if you're thinking about a curator as somebody who stages events, um, you know, creates film festivals, and a much more kind of expanded uh, notion of practice, both artistic practice and curatorial practice, then yes. And it's odd because uh, you, you know, sometimes you see th jobs advertised as curators and they're really producers. Sometimes you see producers and, you know, again, I think Capucine will, will talk about some of the things she's done. It's, it's a really quite high level production, you know, as well. Yeah. yeah. I just say all the, all the organizations I work for, none of them use the word to see word. And they avoid it. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I think it is kind of indicative of the times, maybe. Do you think it's also to do with um, different fields? For example, the theater you wouldn't just break. Yeah, I exactly. I think it is to do with different fields, but I think as the art world expands, it becomes a more relevant term. And I think that often we're not clear about whether it's a curator or a producer, you know. I mean, I, when I uh, ended my kind of, well, and, and end my professional, but my pr professional career outside of academia um, at, with Art on the Underground, it was very much production. You know, I wasn't like making selections so much. I was working with artists to, I don't know, make a new film, create a structure. I think it was production, although I was called a curator, you yeah, know. It's prestige for the organization and mm. prestige for the for the sponsors to say that Charlotte is curated. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, there is a bit of a thing about that, I think, that somehow production is just administration, and but, you know, it's, it's, ter it's terminology, I guess. Okay, so I just wanted to, again, just kind of go, go with this and, um, you know, you, you're not only commissioning, again, just to kind of go through some of the, the practice around it, you know, what does it mean to actually manage these kind of things and, and the issues that one could encounter. Um, it's not only performance that is commissioned, right? New installations, any of this. Does anybody know this story? No? Um, so this is... Um, an artist, Christoph Buchel, who um, is known for really massive installations. So there was one uh, managed by Hauser and, and Wirth uh, in East London many years ago, and it involved like a uh, full-size airplane, you know, massive kind of um, detailed, um, sort of slightly theatrical spaces that he creates. And uh, he has a bit of a, a reputation now in, in the art world, partly because of this situation. So uh, Mass Mocha, a museum in the United States, you know, in the kind of Zayman approach and the approach that Capucine was talking about, where you're, you're not, you know, um, don't have a specific artwork in mind, but you begin a conversation with an artist. And they said, you do these, you know, massive installations that are very detailed. Um, we'd like you to do a project, right? And what happened is uh, the artist became more, more ambitious. The budget kind of increased, it increased. Um, it, it eventually doubled. Okay, and you can say, you know, arts managers, this shouldn't happen, but it does happen, right? It happened with... Um, 
Zaha Hadid in, in Japan recently, and that's like, you know, the Olympics, so it happens. Um, they got to a point where the museum said, we have no more money, you know, you, you've got to stop now, this thing is ready to go, you know. And the artist said, well, we, we, you know, I'm, I'm not finished, we can't open that piece. And the museum has, you know, a deadline, they've set it back, they've put in, I don't even know, do I have the, anyway, hundreds of thousands, if not millions, probably hundreds of thousands of pounds into this. So what do you do? Do you open the exhibition? Do you double the budget? Do you um, close it? And what do you do? <laughs> well, the easy, I thought you were, you know, I thought you, Ferry, were going to say it should never have got to that point. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Um, it will go back to the contract, and, and I'll show you a, f a few things. But I think it... Um, it, you know, it is the art world and it is, it is peculiar, you know, and um, yes, you can go back to the, to the contract, but there are, you know, they have a reputation, for example. Um, so in the end, they tried to open the exhibition because they said, you know, we, we've promised our public this. Um, it was, they received a lot of criticism for that because people sort of said, well, that's, you know, going against the artist's wishes. Um, it went to court and initially they ruled uh, in favor of the museum. And then eventually, kind of three years later, they ruled in favor of the artist. Um, but it was a terrible uh, kind of... Uh, well, in the end, they never opened the exhibition because there was so much kind of backlash from artists in, uh, in the art world. And so you can play the hard line and say the contract and all this. And, but there's also a kind of reputational risk. And, you know, it's a bit like Capucine was saying. There, I think there is a, a sensitivity in the art world. Well, you're not going to ask the artist for that money because what, what she is essentially saying is that's a kind of reputational risk for the Tate if they're seen to be too aggressive or not supporting artists, right? So um, it's a very interesting case study and it's not, it's not the only one. Um, so okay, um, just to, again, this is quite a quick practical uh, slide and I've got a few like this. Um, these are the steps in the commissioning process. Um, you meet the artist, you give the artist, and this actually does not only apply to um, visual arts, I, I mean, uh, this it, it could, could be applicable, I think, to, to other art forms as well, but um, not everybody works in this way, okay, so it could be a kind of open-ended conversation, it could be, uh, you could give the brief, you could solicit a brief, all right, but there's some kind of um, exchange around how the project is going to uh, unfold. Normally these things are very connected to the site, so a site visit is important. Um, this one is interesting. I mean, what do you do uh, if you work, you want to work with an artist, okay, it's the Tate approach, you say we're going to work together, and they come up with a proposal that um, just uh, doesn't work for you. What do you do? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, sometimes, and I think you're right in this, sometimes it's best to part ways early on, you know. Um, so I had the experience with uh, Art on the Underground where it's a very public space, you know, we want to en engage the site and met with an artist and she said, you know, everybody's always thinking about my work as being so social and engaged and actually I just want to go into a studio and make small paintings. <laughs> and, you know, it was a moment where I'm thinking, okay, like, thank you, but this is, this is not the right moment for us to, to work together. So I think that's a very valid point. You got to know, and I'm sure that, that that happens in other situations. Sometimes it works to say, you know what? Um, that's a great proposal, but we did projections of clouds last year, you know, don't know if you know that work, and you know, it, it depends on the artist. 
Um, you draw up the uh, contract and get it signed, seek legal advice if you can. You might have a team of lawyers behind you, you might not, you know, I mean that is the reality, okay. Um, this is important to kind of mitigate, you know, against the um, uncertainties a production schedule. So if you see that deadlines are not being met, if it's, uh, you know, certain things need to be fabricated by a certain point, if that's not happening, you want to know that kind of early on, not at the end of the project when, you know, the thing is due to open and you've invested loads in it. Um, okay, everything else? And then the artist will pay back all the costs made by this, by this if, if they don't, and they will, they will be ready then. well, it depends on what you have um, in the contract. So um, you know that is often in the contract, but again, I think that my experience has been a reluctancy to kind of, you know, necessarily to uphold artists well, to that. Why is this then different to what I'm reading a book called Blockbusters? Uh, the, uh, so sorry, I keep having to come over here because I can't hear you. Yeah. Anita Alves uh, is a professor in the States. It's all about the entertainment industry. Okay. How they contract with, you know, with, with, with stars, with TV and film studios and everything, the bars. Then you have, you know, they, they all walk in these people. You know? They also pick people. Uh, <laughs> and, and they also do, uh, you know, things other people can't do. So what, what, why is that so different from this artist world where right? people I have the freedom to say, well, you know, Yes, it's in the contract, but uh, you know, I'm an artist, so you know, uh, to try to sue me to be your application. Well, what do you think? A any other thoughts? It's the commercial aspect of the world, I think. In the art world, the idea is that you're, not, you're doing it for passion, not for vision, not for fun. But in Hollywood, you're going to get more money. I think Hollywood is a lot of money. I think, I think, um, is it because the creative industry goes away? Like, I don't know, just a right. Is it because the artist is perceived as weak? Kind of, not weak as a yeah. personal level, right? Like yeah. As a profession, right? Mm -hmm. You don't actually really make the money. Yeah. Go ahead, because there's no kind of right answer to this, and and I do think things are shifting. And if anything, you know, you you get kind of artists like Damien Hirst who have a very professional professional operation. So yeah, uh, so I think there are, we we might be uh, moving towards a bit of a well pr professionalization of some of these processes. But I, I'm happy to hear your thoughts. Um, what were you going to say, Janina or Irina? Yeah. The work you're doing and so on and so forth. Um, now there's a difference between that and you can produce whatever you want in your own space with your own money. Um, if you want to enter a certain space, I, I think you have there has to be a certain room for accommodating to you know the expectations of of that space and uh, if you're accepting money. Yeah. I don't know. I think it, it's quite. Uh, I, I don't see why um, it's a profession <laughs> to me. Yep. Um, you know, um, I mean my, 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 my father was a theater actor, and I don't see why he should be treated any differently than any other profession. Um, you get a job, you perform it, or you don't. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> other comments? Yeah, I think it's kind of big. It's similar to, to what you say about. It, to me, it, it's, it's like different fields. They go like. Um, it's, it's a bit different, for example, in film. But, uh, to me, it's like a person who has. Uh, the, you could have the idea, but if you don't have the funds or, or everything else to do it, it's very difficult to say this is how it's going to be. If you also. If, depend on the sponsors, which if we want to have a say, uh, if you're doing film, I've got friends in the film industry, and uh, one of my friends is a film director, and he has 
has proposed some uh, you know, has written the treatment and everything, but at the end of the day, is the producer who actually funds the film yep. has a lot of uh, you know, say in what ends up being done. Um, and with theatre, like for example, when I was working in the theatre, when you commission work, it's a lot to do as well with organization vision, what you want to bring into the organization. You can give the like a platform to that new artist, but it also has to be uh, in line with what the organization is and the vision of the organization. So you have to set those rules. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So, so what do you, what do you think? That it seems to be less um, structured in the art world. Is that what you're suggesting, or? Yeah, yeah. The art world. And different institutions, I think, you know, if you don't like working with a Tate and maybe to work mm -hmm. with a different institution that has a slightly, that is slightly more flexible within certain areas and, you know, they all have a different criteria and a different way of working. Yeah. Um, but I think like without sort of mapping that we deal with the art world, the art thing doesn't exist on its own floating in this empty space. Yeah. It wouldn't happen if it wasn't yeah. Lots of our connections, and yeah. therefore, I think you sort of need to be, um, I don't know, for it to exist in, in, in that space, it, it needs to connect. Yeah. And to connect, you need to compromise at some point. Okay. Like, so, one of the. Paulina and then Emma. Yeah. About this contract, uh, are there places online where you can see an English contract? Because I know that in, in Finnish, the Artists Union has a basic a, 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 yeah. A, a, yeah. A N website, a, which is a, on a, that artist newsletter, but it's on that list. We've got hidden estimates from the library, and they do um, artist contracts on the templates. Yeah, there are some. Was, I've never seen one in a Finnish contract. There are so some. Um, Kind of, I can't remember the name now, but charities uh, that offer, you know, kind of legal advice to um, arts organizations. So there are different ways that you can um, gather information. But I, I think it, I've seen, you know, obviously something like when, in my experience, you know, Transport for London, team of lawyers, you know, very robust contracts and then I've seen the other end where it's like something that I've written and nobody's looked over and you know so I think it like anything it, it does depend on uh, the, the specific context you know yeah, but on that list of um, stuff that we were given from the library the art quest the art quest and the AM have all got contracts in there they're most specific okay um, we'll, we'll look at that then right. yeah uh, one more question, and then I, and then we're gonna. This is actually the end of the kind of practical session on commissioning, so we'll move into the next thing. You know, it's just an observation, really. I was just um, just thinking about you know really ultimately achieving a partnership approach, but I think you know, when you're commissioning, you're inevitably not necessarily commissioning, or maybe you are, and you you help me with this. Um, you're not necessarily commissioning an artist. You're Anybody you've worked around a theme essentially. So you've got not necessarily all your eggs in one basket, i.e., with an artist. And if that creative process goes beyond the, the deadline for, for the show, then okay, that's that that's okay, that's license not to show for that particular artist, but there's other aspects that can be brought in, particularly if it's thematic. If it's a retrospective or particularly around an artist, then I would suggest, and, and again, I don't know enough about the world uh, yet to understand it, but I would suggest that there would be a level of body of work already in existence that then can be shown. So it's not so much of a risk because well, I think, yeah. We're not necessarily commissioned specifically for that piece. Yeah, I, it d would depend on the specific situation. But I think if you're commissioning a new work, then you have kind of, you know, entered into a contract and you've got a portion of that contract set aside a production budget that the artist thinks that they can kind of spend to produce something. I don't think you could, I mean, it would be hard to imagine a situation where you could just 
decide to fill it with pre-existing work. Um, you know, ma many of this stuff is site specific. Um, so it, it would be difficult. I think, you know, it's about uh, calcul there's, there's always going to be uncertainty because you don't know exactly what you're going to end up with. Um, and it's about kind of putting steps in place to um, manage that uncertainty. Yeah, I mean, it's got to be a win win situation ultimately because the artists need the galleries or the, the space. Yeah. And, and the space needs the artists, right? Yes. And it's, it's got to be mutually beneficial. Yes, and did I have, yeah, this is, I mean, anybody that's kind of done project management, you know, there is, th there is that, <laughs> the get out clause, um, which is just the terms by which you end the relationship, and that's actually very important, you know, and it does usually say, um, you know, so-and-so will be responsible, in fact, it's, well, I've seen both, actually, that uh, the artist will be responsible if for the costs incurred, if it doesn't go to fruition, or the other way around, actually, I've seen as well. Sometimes it is maybe about, uh, you know, if it's an individual versus TFL, maybe it's, you know, is it, is it fair to ask that that individual assumes risk and some artists in their galleries wouldn't sign something like that, you know. Um, but I think the important thing is that, um, you know, you have some of these processes in place to mitigate some of these uh, horrible situations.